Hi, everybody. Eve Harrow on Rejuvenation for the Land of Israel Network. It is October 13th, 2018. It's just October 13th, 2018. I'm taping this just a few minutes after midnight. The fifth day of Cheshvan, 5779. And uh, it's been, last week was, wow, it's a really busy and difficult and also a wonderful week in many different ways. So I thought I'd just share some thoughts with you guys about it. The, um, of course, the week began with the terrible terror act in the Barkhan Industrial Zone, an island of coexistence. I don't know, but Kim Levengrad Yecheskel, mother of an 18-month-old, and who was apparently also like her hands were tied behind her back and then she was killed, and Ziv Hajbi, the father of three, were killed essentially by a co-worker. That's how we started the week. And um, it's been, it can't be routine. That like, okay, every week, you know, I mean, Ari Fold was killed close to a month ago, and then this one and that one. There was a time where we would have screamed and yelled and demonstrated. I remember, I remember that, um, living here and, it, we didn't accept anything quietly anymore. And it's not like anybody was accepting this quietly either here, but there were no demonstrations and there people went to visit the family. I wasn't able to, and people went to the funerals and you see it on the news and everyone's grieving, but I don't, are we like used to this now as uh, not just in Israel, but in the world, have we somehow been inured to these terrible things that are happening or there's bigger pictures and I don't know what it is, but I read in the Hebrew paper in Makor on Shabbat, um, someone, Yotam Zimri, whose column I really try and read every week. And, and he expressed so much what I was thinking about during the week. Like, you know, did we even just want to scream? You look at the pictures um, of these two people, you, you see the families that are suffering terribly and how can this be? What is going on here? And Barkan is touted as an island of coexistence. And many people talk about it, myself as well. Arabs and Jews work together. It's about 50-50. Everybody gets the same salaries. Everybody gets, for the same work, everybody gets the same uh, health care benefits or whatever it is. Yet, the Jews, nobody's scared of going to work. I would imagine the Arabs are not scared of going to work. They're not scared of the Jews killing them during the course of the day. And the ones who are talking about coexistence and how we have to move past this and how we still have to go to work are mainly the Jews. What the Arabs were saying is that this terrorist kind of messed it up for them. And they're, you know, even with, and I want so badly to not, to not be suspicious I want so badly to just say like, okay, there's Muslims, there's Christians, there's Jews. I don't want to fear anybody. I don't want to be suspicious of anybody. But because of the society that the Muslims are living in, a society that lauds death, that lauds terror, that pays people to kill other people, we're going to have these niggling suspicions all the time because we're up against something so much bigger than the people themselves. I would like to think that people are inherently good. I know I sound like Anne Frank. That, that's a famous line in her diary. I would really like to believe that. And, and I do not feel that either I am a racist or that most Israelis are racist in that sense of just hating a group of people just because of who they are, what's been done to us over the many, many, many centuries. And I was just in Yad Vashem last week, so we see the results of that. But there are people whom we know are being raised to desire us dead. So where's the middle ground here? Reading this week's Parsha, reading this week's Torah portion on Noah, we had a very interesting discussion at Shabbat dinner, my husband and, and my son and I. Why were they punished, the people of that generation? Where was their moral code coming from? It was before the Torah had been given. It was before the seven mitzvot b'nei noach, the seven um, rules that, that even the, like the most basic rules of humankind that are given to the sons of noach 
about don't kill and don't steal and don't pull a living limb off an animal. The, the seven big moral moral codes, the basics, not like Judaism that goes into so much more than that, but just like the basics of how to be a human being. But assuming that that wasn't given before the flood and before mankind just wiped out and most of the animals too, because apparently the animals were also sinning. The only ones that weren't sinning were the fish and therefore they're allowed to continue to exist, but only the barest remnants of the animals, right? One male and one female so that they can start again and the family. But what moral code were they living by? I mean, if anyone has an answer, if any of you have an answer, I would love to hear it. And so how could they be punished for not living up to what? Is there an inherent humanity that we all have? Is there an inherent humanity that we all have? Like basic red lines be which we won't go and therefore they went beyond that and that's why they had to be wiped out. But who decided? Was there like, were they all in touch with God? And there was like a basic that, that no one wrote about, but it was just there and they broke. So what are those basic rules of humanity? And if those are basic rules of humanity, where are they here in this world right now? Where are they here in the part of the world in which I live? And it's not that Jews and definitely not Christians are perfect. As I said, I spent quite a few hours in Yad Vashem in, in Jerusalem's Holocaust Museum this week, where the smartest people in the world, the most cultured nation that there was, the Germans, perpetrated some of the most vile crimes that humanity has ever known. But I don't even have to go that far, because just this week in Jerusalem, in a cistern under the Russian compound, were found bones bones of decapitated men, women, and even pregnant women. And apparently at least judging initially by the pottery finds with them, it's from the time of Alexander Yanai, the Hasmonean king. And what we know from the historical record is he is a Sadducee, um, took out his anger, his revenge on people who didn't like him, the Pharisees from whom rabbinic Jewry comes from. Uh, and he murdered many of them, 800 by something that I, I've read. And some, and it, so it appears that we have evidence of that travesty now in Jerusalem. So that certainly wasn't anything terrific, to say the least. And that was a Hasmonean king. So what is happening here? Where, what is, are we, are we getting better? Are we getting worse? And the only thing that I can do is look at my own people, look at myself and look at my own people. I saw this horror of this find of the Hasmonean king. And then I look to what's happening here in Israel. And my husband and I just happened to watch a film also on the Eichmann trial. He was kidnapped from Argentina and stood trial. He's the only person that Israel has ever put to death. He was hung for his complicity and his planning of the Holocaust. But I look what's happening around us and I look at the vile, despicable, and, I'm, and I, there's no even words for it, things that other people who live in my country are doing in the name of God or in the name of their society or in the name of, I don't know what. And all I can do is look at my own people and say, okay, Alexandria and I notwithstanding, and that's way over 2000 years ago, what are we doing today? And I go down and I see for myself and I speak to the soldiers that are protecting the border around Gaza. I just spoke to someone from Kerem Shalom, from the community that I visited with a group from One Israel Fund a couple of weeks ago during the holidays. And uh, it looks like we're going to try and get together a mikvah, like try and fund a mikvah, a ritual bath, since now a good number of people who've moved down there are observant Jews, and that's something that they would need. And I'm speaking to the woman that lives there, and she was telling me about not just not just the riots all the time. And Kerem Shalom, a tunnel was just found under Kerem Shalom, a very, very high level tunnel that Hamas has dug from the Gaza Strip into Kerem Shalom in order to kidnap and kill the people there. And she was telling me that there's, she's been there for a long time and she's not going anywhere. But people don't understand how difficult it is. The noises, the smoke all the time from the balloons that's coming in, the psychological warfare that the enemy is perpetrating against them, constantly making noise and booms and, and all kinds of things, and she's trying to protect her children. But how are my people reacting? Still, the soldiers down there are keeping the rioters out of southern Israel. 
but not they're not shooting anyone who isn't armed. They're not shooting women and children. And, and some people might say that that's crazy, that anybody who's out there and anybody who's an enemy and has put themselves on the front line is putting themselves in a position to be killed. But no, the open fire orders of the IDF are very, very strict, even to the point where it endangers the lives of our soldiers. But I don't know. Is that good? Is that bad? I, I, I'm, I'm stumped as to how we're supposed to be fighting a war with one hand held behind our back is what's morality is morality allowing your people to be endangered. So we're trying to provide jobs just to get back to Barkhan. We're trying to provide jobs for the Arabs who live in Judea and Samaria. And there are close to 200 companies and quite a few industrial zones that are doing that because their own leadership isn't providing them jobs and we want them to be happy. We don't want them to suffer. But on the other hand, then that means that we work with them in places where they can go and come in and kill people because clearly the security wasn't good enough, but that shouldn't be the reason that the security was, wasn't good enough. Nobody should be coming to work with a gun. Nobody should even be wanting to come to work with a gun. I'm not saying that they should be oh so grateful to Israel for giving them a job. I'm not naive enough, and I'm not patronizing enough when I know that many of them don't want us here at all, that many of us want to replace Israel with their country, even though many of them know that the country is not going to be anything like Israel is, and that every other example they have of an Arab country or a Muslim country is not a place where any of the individuals have any kind of rights at all. But I, I'm not naive enough or, like I said, patronizing enough for, to expect for them to say thank you for providing them with what their own leaders don't provide them. But still, I think about the Jews that live in these pla- that work in these places, like the two who were killed last week. So is that fair? Is that fair that in the name of coexistence or in the name of providing jobs for the people around us, my people should be vulnerable to being killed, to being hurt? And is this leading to peace? Is what is coexistence? Is it it's working together for what? For what goal? I mean, the goal is eventually to care about each other, to not want to harm each other. When you get to know the other, then you understand that they have a narrative and you have a narrative, but together perhaps you can somehow at least on a day-to-day level live in some kind of peace. But is that ever going to happen? Are we just like fooling ourselves? I I posted something on Facebook after the murders about um, how the, uh, he still, at least as of this taping, the murderer has yet been caught, which is another issue, um, about how his village should be destroyed. Nobody killed Nobody killed because they go and they destroy the the house of the terrorist. But I said it's not enough because clearly a lot of people knew what he was up to doing or what he was up to. And if they don't feel that they're going to be punished, then that's fine. But if they feel that their their home is also going to be lost, then not out of love of Jews or not out of Zionism are they going to turn him in. But maybe they'll do it because they don't want to lose their own homes. And maybe that's a way of stopping all this. So I got somebody who answered me. And I've talked about this before. I said it years ago and people told me I was a terrible person. And I, of course, got an answer last week also. Collective punishment never works. Now, first of all, I don't know where this person knows that collective punishment never works. But then I started thinking also because I'm coming to going to the States in a week and, you know, preparing to travel and a lot of flights. We're all being collectively punished. Every time we go to the airport, I'm not going to blow up the airport. I'm not going to blow up a plane. And I'm going to bet that that every single one of you listening to this show isn't going to either. But every one of us, anytime we go anywhere, has to be humiliated and not take things that we need and not take water and take off our shoes and all that. That's not collective punishment because of a few really, really, really bad people who want to destroy our world and destroy not just our travel, but any place that we feel safe. So there is collective punishment, but it's okay when there's collective punishment against the good people, but it's not okay when there's collective punishment against the group of people that is aiding, abetting, or at best turning a blind eye to the horrors that is being perpetrated in their own society in the name of whatever, their God, their their religion, whatever it is. So there seems to be like some kind of double standard here. 
And it seems to me that a lot of times the double standard is weighed towards those who will make more noise or kill people if they don't get their own way. And therefore, just to bring in another subject, the Temple Mount can be destroyed and Jews and Christians can't pray up there because it's if we don't let Muslims control it, they're the ones who are going to go crazy and riot. So what we're doing is giving in to the violent people that, and that's what's going to make the world a better place. And I'm confused and I'm sharing my thoughts with all of you because sometimes it just gets, it just gets overwhelming and we try and do our best. And I think that Israel is not perfect, far from perfect. I just think that we're pretty much better than everybody else would be in this situation or is in this situation. And it hurts me that there is so much anti-Israel sentiment out there. And I just want to shake people and say, don't you see what is wrong? Don't you see what is wrong with your thinking? I guess you can tell that I'm preparing to go out and do exactly that without the shaking, of course, just like the, you know, (laughs) the searching for words, the searching for words to try and, and present the truth to a world that either doesn't want to hear the truth or doesn't want to hear anything or is intimidated or doesn't want to be called racist. So they're bending over backwards, maybe like Andrea Merkel is doing by letting, by letting people who want to undermine Germany into Germany, like this has her guilt over the Holocaust and what they did maybe gone too far. Uh, not that it really bothers me. I must tell you if, uh, if, if Germany doesn't really survive into the future, sorry, my father was born in Berlin. So I'm always going to have, and, and a lot of his family never made it out of the camp. So I'm always going to have this little piece of, yeah, like it's okay. Maybe revenge is best served cold. But then I was in Berlin a few years ago and went to the Pergamon Museum, which is a fabulous museum on the lines of the Louvre and the British Museum and the other great museums in the world. And one of the things that was there was an exhibit on Ur, which is where Abraham comes from, and walking through there and seeing all the idols and understanding what the backdrop and the context of his world was and how what an incredible human being that he was to say, no, this is wrong, and there's only one God, and there has to be a different way. And he is seen as the paradigm of, of, of chesed, of morality, and of, of worrying about the other, and of even trying to save his nephew Lot, even when the rest of the town is just a horrible, horrible place. So we're supposed to try and find the good people, even the few good people within the many that are not. But maybe sometimes we have to encourage them to be good because instinctively they're not going to be which gets me back to that question about Noah, about Noah and that generation. What were they doing wrong that was so wrong? And what was it that did they know? And if they knew who told them and how do any of us know? So I'm, I'm a Torah believing Jew because it gives me the template upon which to live my life. And I don't always do it. I don't always do it right, but at least I know that then it's wrong at least there's some kind of rule book to follow. But what do we do when so much of humanity is following their rule book, which is antithetical to ours? How do we deal with that? And it's not just Israel's problem. This is everybody's problem. Because whatever starts here never ends here. Never, ever, ever ends here. So those are my thoughts for this morning. I can't even call it Eve's Peeves because it's more than that. Um, it's hope and prayer that the next week will be better, that, um, we'll catch the bad guys and that the rest of them will realize that it's not worth their while to do whatever it is that they want to do. Um, I can only hope and I can only pray. I can only be incredibly proud of Israel and my people that we are not doing what apparently some people did in our history, that we, at least on the learning curve are further ahead and um, maybe in some way making up for the tragedy of the destruction of the second temple, which, as our sages say, was because we hated each other. Maybe what was found in the archaeology ruins in that cistern last week is proof of that. And so we all need to be able to listen to the other, not necessarily agree, but at least listen and keep fighting literally and figuratively 
for a better world. And for those who, for um, all the reasons that I listed above and more, are not in the same place as I am and as, as you, my listeners, are, we have to figure out a way to encourage them to leave the dark side. I don't know how that's going to happen, but we all have to try. Eve Harrow, Rejuvenation on the Land of Israel Network. So happy to hear from any of you, Eve, at thelandofisrael.com. And once again, as always, thanks to Tabitha and Ben for putting in such hard work so that these podcasts continue to come out. Take care, everybody. From the hills of Judea, Eve Harrow, goodbye for now. The question is, why are the Jews there in the first place? The Jewish people have been yearning to return to their ancient homeland for a long time. The Yishai Fleischer Show, the voice of a new generation of pro-Israel activists. And there's only two kinds of minorities in the Middle East, armed or unarmed. Inspiring minds to think differently. That jihadism doesn't just attack Jews. It attacks Christians, and it mostly attacks Muslims. Inspiration, spirituality, and politics. So first and foremost, this country is here to defend Jewish people and to live in its ancestral homeland. Listen to the Yishai Fleischer Show every week on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com.